and welcome. So glad that you could join in with us today. You know, I'm saying this is the day that the Lord have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Because nobody can make a day but the Lord. And the day that he gives us, I don't know about you, but I'm glad for every day that he has given me. And I am super happy for Wednesdays because I get to see you on Wednesdays. And I'm super happy for Sundays. I get to see you on Sundays. And so this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Now, our lesson for today is entitled, Who is My Neighbor? Now, and this, let me say straight up and out right at the beginning, this is the last lesson for the series, Jesus and the Disinherited. This is the last lesson, and then we will, uh, starting uh, the next week, our series will be called, one word, called, C-A-L-L-E-D, called, that we are called, and we're going to see what we have been called for, what Jesus has been called for. Okay? Tune in because they some great lessons. So glad to have each and every one of you. Uh, Louisville Campus, Hardin County Campus, Indiana Campus, Dosco Manor, E Campus, members who are um, um, out of state, as well as members, guests, visitors, and friends in Kentucky, out of Kentucky. It is just wonderful to have you join in with us. Now, who is my neighbor? So a lesson comes in the form of a question. Questions. People always, always ask questions all the time. But questions have are asked for many different reasons. Now, Reason number one, information. But I have found that every question that is asked is not looking for information. Now, I got seven reasons. Let me throw out at you of why people ask questions. You may think of some more, but I got number one is information. And would you believe that is one of the least reasons people ask questions? If you have ever taught, are you a teacher, are you a minister, are you a preacher, whatever, you know people will come and ask you questions just to be asking a question. Not reason number two, testing. And that falls into the questioning part. And I've had that. If you've ever taught, people will ask a question to test you to see what you know, uh, see if you know what you're talking about. Third reason, accusing. They can ask you a question in such a way that they are accusing you. Did you not say? See, they're asking a question, but they're also accusing you. Justification, and many people ask a question to justify themselves. We're going to see that in our lesson. Uh, and if you've taught you know that they use a question to impose a delay. Uh, they can't think of what it is they want to think of, or they just they didn't study their lesson, and so they'll try to delay things. Exert power. Uh, <laughs> you've seen that on the TV, so I don't need to, need to say go into that. And they ask questions in a way that they are making a statement. But... There are two, two supreme questions of life. Questions that could revolutionize the world if we would just ask the question and then heed the answer. What's the question? Question number one. <clears throat> How do we inherit eternal life? Question two. Who is my neighbor? That's the lesson. Who is my neighbor? And in our lesson today, Jesus is asked these two questions. But before we get that, I need to give you a little background. <clears throat> Racism, prejudice, discrimination are sins. I said sins. They have been around as long as humanity. 
And all they have done is taken God's very good and beautiful design people and in all its diversity and corrupt, it has turned it into something that God did not intend to be, something ugly. And racism, prejudice, discrimination is ugly. It's ugly. Well, those sins have existed down through the history and still it's in every corner of the world in some form or fashion. Now, there has always been a long and bitter history between the Jews and the Samaritans. Let me give you a little history. After the Assyrian conquered the northern kingdom, and that would be the ten tribes, those Jews captured and exiled, returned, and intermarried with the Assyrians. And so their religion became a mixture. Uh, some of them just held to the first five books. Others incorporated idolatry practices. And nearly 300 years later, when Ezra returned to start the rebuilding of Jerusalem after the Babylon, see, because Babylon during the time that the northern kingdom was in exile, uh, the southern kingdom, Judah, uh, had been also put in exile in Babylon. So when the exiles returned from Babylon and they wanted to rebuild the temple, uh, the Jews, the Samaritans wanted to help the Jews. Now, look in Ezra chapter 4, verse 1 through 4, and this is the amplified version. And this is what it said. Now, when the Samaritans, the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin, heard that the exiles from the captivity were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel, now governor, and said to the heads of the father's houses, and said, let us be with you. Let us be with you. See, these are the Samaritans wanting to help build the temple. For we seek and worship your God as you do. Did you hear what I'm saying? We seek and worship your God as you do. And we have sacrificed to him since the days of Asaphadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Jerubbabel and Yeshua, that means Joshua, and the rest of the heads of fathers' houses of Israel said to them, You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God but we ourselves will together build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the Samaritans, the people of the land, continually weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled and terrified them in building. So from, the, from there, the Samaritans went on and built their own temple. Now, around 9 AD, 9 AD, when Jesus was a young boy, some Samaritans secretly joined in with the Jews going to the temple in Jerusalem for Passover. Once inside, they desecrated the temple by spreading human, bone, human bones around the sanctuary. And out in the courts, and this is probably the most sacrilege thing that you could do into the temple aside from destroying it. Now, if you remember when Jesus encountered the Samaritan woman at the well, you would note the tension, not with Jesus, because he, he saw her. Because remember, <clears throat> in John chapter 4, it started out with saying Jesus must needs go through Samaria because he wanted to meet with this woman. 
So in John 4, Jesus says, should a woman, uh, hey, let me have a drink of water. And her response was, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. I ain't just, just a Samaritan, but I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. She went on to let him know our ancestor worship on this mountain. But you Jews claim, notice what you Jews claim, that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now, and I'm sure that she, that she knew the history that the Jews did not want the Samaritans to help build that temple. And Jesus replied to her, you remember when he replied to her, see, you need to know some of the history so that you can understand why the tension. He said, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. And he goes on to say in verse 22 of John chapter 4, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. And then elsewhere in, in Luke, we saw when the Samaritans turned their face from Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem, James and John wanted to call down fire from heaven and destroy them. Well, the animosity there was something. And you know what is so amazing is that that is what we see today. It's not as bad as it could be, but we have such tension between the black race and the white race, Hispanics, Mexicans, and it ought not be. It ought not be. So we are going to look at this parable again, familiar parable. And we are going to try to open our eyes to what God would have us to do. Now, this parable is bold. And you can use it anytime. Interchange the characters if you want. And whatever racism and hatred is found, this parable will meet and make the point that God is not one who favors one over the other. Now, it starts with the interchange between Jesus and a lawyer. Now, Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 29, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and test him. You see, test him saying, getting ready to ask a question. Didn't I tell you at the top of the lesson that people will ask questions to test you? And here we have it right here. Saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, this is Jesus answering. And, and, and. Boy, it's a good thing that my mama wasn't around because my mama would say, uh, you don't answer a question by asking a question. But this is exactly what Jesus does. He said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. 
And he said to him, this is Jesus, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, the lawyer, wanted to justify himself. There is that word justify. I told you that one of the seven reasons people ask questions. So now he tested him. And now he wants to justify himself. And he says to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Woo! Now let's first look at this crafty lawyer. Now we must see that this, it says lawyer, but a lawyer was not a secular lawyer as we know and understand today. But he was an expert in the law. That's why he's called a lawyer, because he was an expert in the law of Moses. So, but we see right away that this man's uh, motives are amiss. He's not truly seeking an answer to his question, but really he was hoping to trip Jesus up. And, and that's what he's asking his question for. But notice, oh, he good. He smooth. This brother smooth. Because he first stood up showing respect. So he stood up to ask a question of Jesus. Now, it was a testing question. And the word test can be translated tempt. Because tempt and test are the same meaning in the Hebrew Greek language. So really, he is challenging Jesus. Now, notice what the lawyer said, what must I do? Or what shall I do? As if he needs to do something to earn eternal life. But now, look, he said, what shall I do to inherit? And when you inherit something, it's given to you. You don't do anything to inherit something. It's the, it's, it's the owner's right to give and do as he pleased. But he wants to see, how can I do it? So it was a testing question because it was designed to test Jesus. Now, but he has another. The first question was a testing question. The second question is a target question. Well, who is my neighbor? And the Greek word for neighbor means one who is near. So now he wants to try and trip Jesus up. The interesting thing to notice, Jesus never answers his question. He didn't answer the first question because Jesus asked him, when he asked the first question, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asked him a question. So when he comes back with the second question, who is my neighbor? Jesus just starts telling him this parable. Now, Let's read the parable. Luke chapter 10, verse 30 through 37. Then Jesus answered, see, and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And you, you need to understand, half dead means half alive as well. So he didn't, they didn't kill him. Now, by chance, by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. 
And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and banished his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two dinner rights, gave them to the innkeeper, said to him, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So Jesus now comes to a question himself. He's going to ask, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? What do you think? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. You got to catch it. He, this man is so prejudiced that he couldn't even say of the Samaritan, he said, he who showed mercy. He wasn't about to say what well, the Samaritan, he said, he who showed mercy. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Now, this you will recognize as the parable, as we call it, of the Good Samaritan. Now, let me stop right here and tell you, nowhere in the Bible is this parable called Parable of the Good Samaritan. Why not? Because good and Samaritan did not go together. That's oxymoron as far as the Jews are concerned because there could not be a good Samaritan. Uh, <laughs> the, just like there's no such thing. Yeah, years ago. Uh, yeah. Whew. There was no such thing as a good nigga. Uh-uh. You don't put them together. It's oxymoron. The only good nigga was a dead nigga. That was the thought. I'm just, I'm just taking the gloves off. We may as well take them off. The only way we're going to start some healing in this land is come face to face with how terrible, how evil we are. Now, notice I said we. I'm not saying any. I ain't saying 45. I ain't saying marriage. I ain't saying nothing. We all are. For the Bible said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So this man could not, he's so, he's so biased, so prejudiced, he could not even say, uh, uh, you would not even say good and Samaritan together. He wouldn't even say Samaritan. He just said, uh, he who showed mercy on him. So now let's look at this again. Because we're going to flip this thing. I think I told you, whoo. Uh, I don't know what series we were studying when I told you it was going to come back up again. So let's look at certain people. Now, we always identify this man as being a Jew. Why? Because he said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So we figured he leaving Jerusalem, he was a Jew. But what let's 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 just take a look at it. Let's look at the identity. We are traveling along the road. Who is that there? There's somebody laying in the road. What if the man was a black man? Hispanic, a, a white man, would you stop? What if it was an immigrant who, who we proposed and said, oh, yeah, let's build a wall to keep them out. And every one of our families can be traced back immigrating into this country, except black folks. We, we didn't immigrate. We were drug over here. But you see, what if it's a single mom lying in the road? No, 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 okay. Suppose it was a 
poor and unemployed person, would you walk on by? What if it was a, a homosexual or a lesbian? Would you walk by? Would you help? All right. What if it's a, just a West End resident? Because you know we outlaws here in the West End. And at least that's what people think. Now, or what is when you go to stop to help or you look down at them, they are an LGBTQ person. See, that's what we got to come face to face with. If you wouldn't stop and help the least, the last, the lost, then you're not acting like Jesus. And any one of these groups here can be jumped by a gang because that's what he said and fell among thieves who stripped him, robbed him, wounded him, departed and left him half dead. Well, what gang was that? I call it the P gang. The police, because we've seen what they've done and I, I've told you, I'm not one of those ones that want to defund the police because I don't want to live around here without some police. The police, policies, and politics, that's the gang that has jumped on this group of folks, whether they black, immigrant, single mom, homosexual, poor, unemployed, West End, LGBTQ, the policies, procedures, Politics, police have jumped us, stripped us, beaten us, and left us half dead. But notice, half dead. They didn't leave us dead, half dead. Because as long as I got breath in my body, I'm, I can do something. And this is what we got to see. And they were probably stereotyped because th this group of folks have been stereotyped as ignorant. And they probably seen as lacking education, lacking goals and aspirations, lacking good sense. Well, what is good sense? See, your good sense may not be my good sense. I'll, I'll, I'll make it plain. See, see, if you told me you voted for Donald Trump, I think you didn't have good sense. If, you, if I told you I voted for Joe Biden, you probably think I don't have good sense. So what is good sense? But you know, we said it in the lesson last week. Many times we look down on people and think that they are in that situation because they had to have done something wrong. They decision making was off. So we feel they're ignorant, they're irresponsible, lazy. If I could just tell you all how many times we as a black race have been labeled lazy. And I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> some of the hardest working people that I know are black folks. God, they gotta have two or three jobs. My mama, she was a hard working woman. And they called me a workaholic, so you know what the heck. Oh uh, yeah, and somebody's shaking their head, yeah. Uh, who, who's lazy? I look at my pastor before COVID-19 set him down. He was pre preaching six sermons on the weekend. Seven to eight, nine to ten during the week all, all coming together because of funerals and, and midweek service. Yeah, yeah, there are some lazy black people. Hey, poops, there are some lazy white people. Senior, some lazy Hispanic. So don't put a label on folks. And I do, we lack good decision-making skills. Well, I'm going to tell you, I have made some mistakes in decision-making, but the best decision that I ever made was making Jesus my choice. Now, 
I hope that your decision-making skills was as good as mine when it comes to that. Because making him or following him is a choice. It's a decision. I've decided to make Jesus my choice. And we can see them not only as ignorant, irresponsible, but insignificant, unwanted, undesirable, unnecessary. Yeah, try and send black folks back to Africa and see how long this country will last. Okay, all right, all right. So that's certain people. So we saw the crafty lawyer look at certain people and we discover that they could be uh, any group of people. Now let's look at, woo, church people. Now, let's look at church people. So Jesus proceeded to tell how two individual church people, both returning from Jerusalem, most likely having served in the temple. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. They leave church, but act unchurched. And many of us got that same problem. Now, let's say he was a Jew. Let's go back to the parable. Let's say he was a Jew. The victim's own countrymen ignored him. And my sisters and brothers, we do the same. Worse, they hail positions of prominence um, and the victim could or should have expected mercy, compassion from these people because I just got through reading one, a certain priest and then a Levi and he could expect to receive mercy and compassion. Remember last week's lesson. I said to you, suppose you were a big out on the street. And you hear, and you are, let, let's say now, let's suppose not only you beggar, but you done been beat up, left half dead. And through that swollen eye that you could barely get open, someone is coming. And the closer they get, at first you're a little scared because you wonder if they're coming back. But then you discover and you think, well, wait a minute. I've seen him before. Yeah, because his hair was like lamb wool. His eyes were like coals of fire. You say, yeah, that's Jesus. He was in service. He was in church with me. I saw him. And he walked past you. Whoo. How would you feel? Well, I would expect mercy and compassion. And get none? Well, my Lord. Now notice this. The priest. When he and they can't even use the excuse. Well, I didn't see him. You know, we love to use that excuse. Well, I didn't see him, but the priest saw him. Passed by on the other side. The Levite came and looked. I think that's what I said. The Levite, when he arrived at the spot, came and looked. Now, uh, let me ask you. The priest saw him. The Levite came and looked at him. Is there a difference between seeing the person and looking at the person. What does, I want you to think about that. What does a person mean when they say, you are looking but you don't see? And see, we talked about this last week. I need you to understand we need to start. This is our third lesson about looking and seeing. I remember them now. 
Riddle, 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 I see something you don't see. You remember that lesson? We talked about what do you see? Then we did last week's lesson. Do you see me? And now we come to this week's lesson and we ask, who is my neighbor? But we're still talking about opening up our eyes and see. Look. To see. We said last week was to comprehend, was to uh, uh, grasp, was to understand. So, and when you look, you can look and just glance at something, but you can also gaze at something. And that's why, because John the Baptist said, look, behold the Lamb of God. He means open your eyes and see him. Old school song used to be, only a look. It means to, to, to gaze at him, to see him, to comprehend, to understand. Not just glance at you. If you glance at Jesus and keep on walking, no, you didn't look, you didn't see him either. But we need to start seeing people. Now, another point to ponder. During the COVID-19 pandemic, when or is it, or when is social distancing possible for the church? Or is it possible for the church? I don't mean to keep yourself unsafe. But let me ask you this question. Are we using social distancing as an excuse not to help? Think about it. Think about it. Now, I, uh, no, my time don't allow me. I was going to, see, this same parable was written by Clarence Jordan. It's in the Cotton Patch version of Luke and Acts, and uh, it's more modern, but my time don't permit me. I don't know what I did. I get me in front of teaching, and I just run amok. So let's, let's go back. So we talked about the crafty lawyer. We talked about certain people. We talked about church people. Now let's talk about Christian people. Ooh. And you're probably thinking, well, uh, isn't that the same as church people? No. No. Church people. Our people go to church. <laughs> they get up and they leave. They listen to the pastor. They may shake their head or they may even go to sleep. But we're talking about Christian people. And the only way because we got some dark days ahead. And if you can't see that, then you, 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 Steve, Stevie Wonder, Ray Charles, you're blind. But I say we can make the next 72 days or whatever days it is and we don't have to see our country divided or split if Christian people who know the Lord, who love the Lord, and I said no, because see, there are some people up in church that don't know him, because he does not, he does not, show favoritism. He does not show prejudice. He does not put one over the other. And yet we have church people, I say church people, who would gladly will call you out of your name, will say things about you, will hate you because of your color or whatever. But a Christian 
won't do it. And the relationship between black and white America has historically been characterized by prejudice, animosity, and distrust. Because you see, the church in America, before COVID-19 came along, the church practiced social distancing. It has always been we versus them attitude. And it needs to be us and us attitude. That's what it should be. In other words, it is going to take those who love the Lord, like um, mm, names are slipping my head, but there is a group of white ministers that meet with black ministers. They, in, in fact, the West End Farm was about that, white and black coming together. How can we get this thing together? And I salute Dr. Cosby for doing it. Because we will not get this right until the church gets it right. And the Good Samaritan story, when you place it particularly within the overall theology of Luke, and Acts, because Luke wrote, wrote, wrote them both, it destabilizes our inherited black-white worldview and challenges us to move beyond us versus them, that we all are God's children. I know when I was coming up in the cradle row, Sunday school class, we would say red or yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight, because Jesus loves the little children of the world. He loves us all. So who is my neighbor? It's anyone in need, regardless of race, regardless of nationality, regardless of gender, regardless of any differences that we may have. What is my obligation to my neighbor? And Jesus said it best. He said, go and do likewise. Go, show compassion. Go, show love to all people. Matthew 22, 37 through 40 says, because Jesus quoted the Old Testament and it tells you. And he said to him, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands depend all the law and the prophets. Paul validates this as well. In Romans 13, 8 through 10, he said, owe oh, no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And love does no wrong to a, no, to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So if we look and remember last week's lesson, along with this week's lesson, and we see that these people bear the image of God and respect that image in others so much that we would not pass them by because they are homeless, because they're out on the street, we get a big picture of just how far neighborly love and compassion can exist or extend. 
But let me say this before I go. Let me give you, because I talked about, oh, crafty lawyer and certain people, church people, Christian people. Now, let me give you a critical warning. All those are C words. When you help somebody, when you love somebody, or when you give to help somebody, don't get a false sense of pride thinking that you have done so much. We do need to be compassionate. But our love must extend from a level, from a level playing field, let me put it that way. From a heart that recognizes that we are equals, made in and bearing the same image, God's image. That we are not better than anyone, no. We are just better off at this moment. That's all it is. We're just better off at this moment. So the command to love our neighbor must always be seen as equals helping equals in an unequal situation. Woo! Let me say that one again. When we love our neighbors, we must always be seen as equals, loving equals, or helping equals in an unequal situation. So when we help someone, let us do it from a heart of love, simply because that person is my neighbor in need. That's our lesson and that's our series, Jesus and the Disinherited. Believe you me, there is a whole lot more in the Bible. I challenge and I charge you to read it. Next week, we will start a new series called that will take us out for the rest of the year, the called series. God bless you. God keep you and we'll see you next week.